There is no question in Dr. Samantha Nutt's mind that education in women are critical to world peace. She has worked her way through dangerous war zones, met with victims, child soldiers, military hotshots, and dedicated aid workers. She outlines the chilling truth about war and its wagers in her From the Heart Brave book called Damn Nations, Greed, Guns, Armies, and Aid. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Samantha Nutt back to Studio 4 to tell us more. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Thank you for, uh, for having me back. I was reading what Stephen Lewis had to say about this book, and he said he read it in one sitting. Uh, I read it in two. Well, that's good. Thank you for reading it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, usually you say, okay, a little homework, have to get through this somehow because Dr. Nutt is coming. <laughs> not that you're not a good writer, but it is compelling. It's shocking. Everything we don't want to know about contemporary war, really, and a few things we do need to know. Well, and I, that was the point in writing the book, was to actually introduce some of the issues to people in new and different ways. Um, it's been described as a memoir. It actually isn't a memoir, although it does chronicle the last 16 years of my work in war-torn countries. But the stories of people that I have met and worked with and people who have really inspired me, they really anchor the issues. And really, it, this is a book about the factors that lead to conflict, what we're doing wrong around the world, uh, what we might do differently, and, uh, and where we go from here. And also uh, how we in the West are fueling what's going on in the war-torn countries. Absolutely. How are we doing that exactly? Well, we are, unfortunately, all consumers of war. It is in our pension funds, virtually every single provincial teacher's pension fund in this country, and the Canadian Pension Plan. We have money, hundreds of millions of dollars invested in the world's top 100 arms manufacturers. It's in our cell phones and in our computers in the form of coltan and tin and tungsten and other conflict resources that are mined from places like the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, which has lost five million people to war since 1990. It's uh, you know it's in, it's filling up our cars. It's on our ring fingers in the form of conflict diamonds. Mm -hmm. So war is really in everything we do, and that's one of the points that I make in the book is just how connected we are to conflict. Um, not just to point that out for people, but to also help us all understand that making a change isn't as difficult as we think because it isn't all about what's happening over there. It is also about what's happening here as well. But as a, a teacher in any province, if you think that part of your pension is funding international arms, and I know that the, the rich nations always sell to the poor, but still, you th it's very hard to make the connect. It can be, but I mean, I, this is one of the things that I do blow open in the book and spend quite a lot of time writing about um, what people need to know and, and how they can get access to this information and what they might do about it. Mm -hmm. And what can we do about it? Well, there are a number of things. I have a whole chapter that's actually about the kinds of changes that we can make. But one uh, active thing we can do is we can divest from war. And there are many examples of, of countries, but also public pension funds, particularly in the Scandinavian countries, that list every year companies that they feel are involved in atrocities in other parts of the world that don't meet with their ethical uh, sniff mm -hmm. test, essentially. And so they divest from them and won't allow the national pension funds to be invested in them. That's one way you can make a difference. Another way to make a difference is to give, but to know what kind of giving actually works. Smaller contributions on a regular basis are much more effective than, than one-off contributions when we see a crisis in the news because often the, the needs were great before the crisis happened, they're just as great after, and it takes about a, a generation to see the effects of well-managed aid. So again, these are some of the issues I get into in damnation so that people can be more formed and more aware and make different choices. Absolutely. Uh, what is wrong with this particular picture? You put uh, the military in charge of humanitarian aid. And this is a growing issue. The militarization of aid, which is uh, what I refer to it uh, in, in, as in the book, is, is actually blurring the lines between what is military and political operations and what is civilian operations. And it has enormous consequences. So for example, in Iraq and Afghanistan, as part of our hearts and minds strategies, Canadians, Americans, other uh, allied forces, we have uh, been ha having soldiers and, 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 and military groups actively involved in reconstruction projects, in humanitarian programs like food distributions, water distribution, school reconstruction. And the challenge with that is that it politicizes that which should never be 
political. And we're seeing the effects of that. We are seeing more aid workers now who are killed in the line of duty uh, over the past 10 years than ever before. It's up by close to 200 percent. We're seeing more civilians die on these programs because they are seen as being militarily aligned uh, and they're more frequently targeted. And we're also seeing soldiers that are being killed. We've had Canadian soldiers and European soldiers and others who have died uh, implementing these programs because they are simply not as well protected and they're in the communities. And it's, um, it's a strategy that needs to change. Tell me about the aid worker in Iraq, a uh, friend of yours, female. I'm married to an Iraqi, I believe. Yes, that was my friend uh, Margaret Hassan, and she was yes. the head of CARE International mm -hmm. operating in, in Baghdad. It was an international humanitarian organization. She had lived and worked in Iraq for almost three decades, and she was a dual Iraqi British citizen. Uh, and I got to know Margaret in the mid-1990s because she was a woman that was doing extraordinarily courageous and important work on behalf of Iraqi civilians, uh, looking at the impact of sanctions and, and also the impact of the first war and then the 2003 war. And, um, you know, Margaret was, to me, she was a, a mentor and a hero. She was very outspoken about uh, the, the presence of U.S. troops in Iraq. Um, and in the end, unfortunately, she was taken on her way to the care office. She was held hostage for, uh, well, we don't know for sure, but for about two to four weeks. Um, and uh, eventually she was executed, but not before they uh, forced her. They had m multiple videotape statements uh, that they broadcast all around the world. When she sat in a meeting with a, a commander, top commander, uh, to talk, because as you know, they gather and say, what can we do? Uh, where is aid needed? How much is needed? What's going on in the ground or, or with the women and the children? Not that they don't know some of it, but so what would she say to them? Well, she was, <laughs> the, she, she she was, was very gutsy. outspoken. She, mm. she was really gutsy, and she was very forthright and very honest. And I can remember being at a meeting with her uh, with the chief military commanders, uh, American commanders in Iraq, and they were trying to understand what the most urgent humanitarian needs were. And, you know, I remember Margaret, and I write about this, standing up and, and just being dumbfounded uh, by the situation, but really turning around and saying, you know, you, you've invited us here to ask us what people are feeling, and can you not see it for yourselves? And she was um, forthright, she was honest, she was constructive, um, and she was widely regarded as, as the, the, the main humanitarian expert uh, in Iraq mm -hmm. at, at, at that time. And as you know so well, it's one thing to be a main humanitarian expert, which you are. It's another thing to be listened to and heard and to make change. Absolutely, but Margaret, Margaret was extremely well respected, and because mm -hmm. she was a dual Iraqi uh, British citizen, she had very strong ties to the community and was uh, really instrumental in, in helping to, to stage humanitarian operations in that country. Right. How, when you're in the streets of, say, Somalia, do you get to the women? Do you get to the people? Well, sometimes it's very difficult. And my first experience in Somalia was in the mid-1990s. It was a very difficult time within that country. It still is. It's a country that has been a failed state now for two decades. And uh, it's, it's hard to get access. Sometimes you have to deal with, often I've had to deal with armed teenage boys. Um, who have more, much greater access to weapons than they even have access to clean drinking water, who make it impossible for you to get to the people that, that need your services, but also who make it impossible for those who need those services to come to you. And uh, it results in famine, it results in, in uh, deaths, needless deaths, um, and it's, uh, it's something that, it's, that we see not just in Somalia, but in other countries as mm -hmm. well. For sure. Uh, where were you with the child soldiers? I've been all over the world I know, with child soldiers. But this was in a particular place where they were housing, reforming yes, the child in, soldiers. Was it Congo? That was in Eastern Congo. That was in Eastern Congo. Tell me that story. A uh, young boy. Yes. Well, I, when we were, you walked in. When I, well, when I walked in to this rehabilitation center, I was doing an evaluation. And uh, there's one, there are a couple of young boys that are playing with, um, with some, some pop cans, essentially. And there's another young boy on the side who's about 12 who's openly masturbating. Um, and, you know, and, and pushing me, right? I mean, he certainly he saw me come in, and you could tell they were all joking around about it and trying to see what response I would have. And then when I went to leave, I was in the vehicle, and they came, and they demanded money. And I said that I didn't have any money. And then they started to uh, basically attack the car and to rock the car. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these young boys were deeply traumatized. And next time you come here without money or... Well, that's what they said Without to me. Without something, said. we'll rape you and we'll pour gas on you. 
And we'll set you on fire. And we'll set you on fire. They're not, um, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes in these situations to remember that, that these boys are victims as well. Many mm -hmm. of them were taken from their homes at, at gunpoint or forced to fight uh, in a war that they barely understand. They've experienced years and years of deep psychological trauma. Um, and they, uh, some of them have developed such ex horrific pathology that it's very, very hard to undo that damage. Yes, Ismail Bayo was here who wrote uh, Long Way Home. Yes, long way gone. Yeah, long way gone. Yeah, uh, reformed. Well, is that the right word? I, uh, was a child soldier. Had been through it all. How do they recruit them? What What are the keys to recruiting child soldiers in any country? In Congo, Somalia, Darfur. Well, there are several hundred thousand child soldiers around the world, and there are a number of different strategies that are used. Uh, one is that it's it's in, a, in a, an environment where there are few jobs and few opportunities to go to school. Obviously, money becomes uh, an incentive, and many kids join up at the ages of six to ten for as little as three hundred dollars. And once they're in, you know, there it's very hard to break. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, and we see this in northern Uganda and Congo, uh, their villages are attacked at night. They are abducted from their homes. They're forced to kill members of their own family so that they don't try to flee uh, back home. And, uh, and they end up fighting for, for years in that kind of situation. Um, and those tend to be the two biggest strategies. In other areas, it's also through ideology. I mean, Al-Qaeda Al and, and other terrorist organizations will, will often try to recruit young men, especially by, by appealing to their sense of anger and their sense of dis disaffection um, and, uh, and nurturing that and then deploying that. And what about the young women? The young women as well. The, the young women as well. They're often, uh, if they're not involved in direct combat, which some of them are, mm -hmm. um, but about 40 percent of those who are are participating as, as child soldiers in some way are, are girls. Uh, but they're often used in informal ways. So as sex slaves, as porters, they cook, they clean. They're forced into marriages with these uh, militias, militia groups, and um, and live extraordinarily difficult, difficult mm -hmm. lives. And many not educated. Almost all of them have very little education. And as you suggest, aid is wasted if a woman is not educated. Where well, do you start in whatever country? Well, education is key, uh, always, and especially girls' education. And we, we do know, I mean, you look all around the world at the factors that lead to, for example, the death of children under five. And we know that education is, is critical to reducing child mortality. In fact, a great study that was published recently by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in The Lancet looked at 30 years of data from developing countries and found that for every extra year of education a girl in the developing world receives, child mortality drops by 10%. Mm. So we know that education and girls' education is critically important to peace and stability and to saving lives. Um, the other piece of it, though, is youth em employment. You know, when you look at most of the countries around the world that are in conflict, about 60% of their population is under the age of 30. So unless you're providing alternatives through development programs to militia groups that target them um, and allow them to get caught up on their schooling through, through aid initiatives, mm -hmm. you see these young men that whether there's war or not, they end up going on to form criminal gangs and continuing to, to rape and to loot and to pillage mm -hmm. and to contribute to violence. And you see a mother uh, uh, attempting to walk her child to school who gets raped on the way. It's awful. I mean, it's yeah. awful. And you see this all around the world. But um, you know, Eastern Congo, in, in particular, has been uh, uh, horrific in terms of the, the use of, of rape during the conflict and even in the aftermath of the conflict as mm -hmm. well. When we come back, we'll talk about that, because I know elections, probably not their elections, but elections did happen in the Congo. Damn nations, greed guns, armies, and aid. Samantha Nutt, our guest, she's a medical doctor, humanitarian, co-founder of War Child.